The next speaker is Gagan Agarwal from Google. We'll talk about market algorithms for auto bidding. My name is Gagan Agarwal. I co-lead the market algorithms research team at Google. Uh, today, I'll be talking about market algorithms for auto bidding. Uh, this is joint work with Ashwin, Aranyak, Andres, Ariel, Junya, and Mingfei, who are all colleagues at Google, except for Junya, who is a student at Stanford. So this is a brief outline of my talk. I'll start by introducing auto bidding, and then I'll talk about a few research, new research questions that have arisen in the context of auto bidding. Um, so you're all probably, uh, so we'll start with, you know, what is auto bidding? So to do that, we'll first start with just the basic introduction to auctions uh, that are used for selling online advertising. So you're probably familiar with the um, ads that are shown on the Google search page. When you search for something like running shoes, um, Google will show you some ads uh, for that. And these ads are selected using an auction. Um, so whenever a query comes in, we retrieve all the ads which are relevant to the query, and then uh, we use an auction to decide which ads to show and how much to price uh, them for. Um, right? And the uh, common auction which is used for selling a single item is the second price auction or the Vickery auction in which the item is given to the highest bidder for a price equal to the second highest bid. So from an advertiser's perspective, from a buyer's perspective, they're not really participating in just one auction. They're typically bidding for a keyword and they're submitting a per click bid for the keyword. And all the queries that come in that are, that are relevant for the keyword, they participate in all of those auctions using the bid for this keyword. And what they get in the end is a total number of impressions, clicks, conversions, costs. So like these are the things which are relevant to them. So recently, advertisers have been increasingly using this notion of auto bidding, where instead of bidding directly into the auctions, instead of directly submitting per, key, per keyword bids, they give their goals and their constraints to an auto bidding system, which converts them to bids on their behalf. And the auto bidder uh, will take in these goals and constraints and try and optimize the objective function subject to the constraints that the advertiser has, has specified. And some examples of these could be that you're trying to maximize your clicks subject to budget constraint, or you're trying to maximize conversion subject to average cost per conversion constraints and so on, or you can have multiple of these constraints. Um, and this is increasingly being used in the advertising industry and most of the major advertising platforms offer some form of auto bidding now. Um, and here are some examples from Google. So auto bidding has given rise to several new research directions, and I'll talk about some of them in this talk. Um, so uh, many of these questions are of course still open and they're an active area of investigation. So I'll just like touch upon the new things that we are, we are thinking about these days. So the first problem I'll talk about is algorithms for auto bidding. Uh, so the problem here is as follows. So we have, uh, so, so we are now looking at the point of view of the auto bidding system. It has received some goals and constraints and it wants to maximize the objective function subject to the constraints. So it essentially has multiple items that it can buy. For, for, to begin with, we'll assume that, that these items have a fixed price. We already know the price and the item I has a price of PI. In addition, um, we'll assume there's a budget constraint and what's called a TCPA constraint, which is an average cost per conversion constraint. We'll generalize, we can generalize this to other constraints as well, but that's what we'll talk about here. So this problem can be represented as an integer program and I have shown the, IP, uh, the LP relaxation on the right, uh, and we can solve this LP and that will give us, that will solve the item selection problem for us. We know which items to take, right? But the solution is not super useful because it gives me for every item I need to remember, do I want to take it or not? That's like a lot of stuff to remember when I'm actually trying to implement it. It's not very usable in practice. So to get a more usable solution, we use the dual and um, we solve the dual and we can show that 
if um, so here like I have these two constraints that alpha and beta be the dual variables corresponding to them, then if alpha star and beta star are the optimal dual variables, then the items that you want to take are over here, like it's represented by this condition, right? This just follows from, um, you know, simple duality theory. So now this algorithm actually starts looking useful in practice because I have, I can solve the dual on a sample, on a representative, representative sample of my data and get the alpha star and beta star from there. And then I can use it to decide which items to take in the future. And this extends to more general linear constraints and objective functions as well. So are those excess actually valid or just probabilities? Oh, say that again. So they are supposed to be zero and one, but when I solve the LP, it is a fractional solution. What we can show is that since if there are only two constraints, it depends on the number of constraints, but the number of fractional excise you will get is bounded, like in this case, it'll be two. And in practice, we'll just ignore that. Like you can take them, like if X is fractional, just take it, set it to one. You might violate your constraints by like the cost of one item. And typically in practice, the cost of one item is really small and nobody really cares about that. So, um, so that's like the, the yeah. so, in, so to model it, you have to see that you'll be willing to violate your constraints by a little bit. Okay. So, just to connect this to the auction, right? So far we said that the item prices were fixed, but what if the item prices are coming from an auction? Let's say that the seller was, was using a second price auction to sell each item. Um, in that case, the price of an item is the uh, second highest. The next is the price of an item is the highest bid among all the other bidders. So I'm a fixed bidder, it's the, it's the highest bid among all the other bidders. In that case, uh, we can just uh, bid this amount, basically. We just wanted to take everything whose price was, was lower than this amount. Uh, so if we just bid this amount, we'll, because it's a second price auction, we'll get exactly the right items. So it really fits very well into the second price paradigm. Um, unfortunately, if the auction is not truthful, this doesn't work as well. Um, in fact, the optimal bidding algorithm for non-truthful auctions can be fairly complex. Um, So the next thing we'll talk about is what happens when the we are not just looking at the perspective of one bidder keeping all the other bids fixed, but all the bidders are in fact using auto bidders. So everybody is using an auto bidder and the bids can change, right? So that's our next question. And clearly the bid of the optimal bid for a bidder depends on the prices that they are seeing and the prices that they see depends on the bids of the other bidders. So they keep responding to each other's bids till they reach an equilibrium. And, um, and then the question is, um, you know, what properties of this equilibrium can we prove? So what we can show is that um, the equilibrium exists under certain conditions, uh, basically some kind of continuity conditions, the items being small and things like that. Um, and it is PPAD hard to compute. Then we look at this question of how good is the equilibrium in terms of the welfare or the efficiency of the equilibrium. Um, that is, uh, is the welfare at equilibrium, how does it compare to the best possible welfare when the agents are not even strategic, say, and you could make them do whatever they want to do instead of them behaving strategically. Uh, this is called the price of anarchy. Um, in this setting, even the definition of efficiency is interesting because bidders have cost constraints, so you can't just take their value as, as such to compute the efficiency, but you can define a reasonable notion of efficiency. And for that, you can show that the price of anarchy is two if the underlying auction that you're using is VCG. Um, and there are other papers which figure out the price of anarchy or bound the price of anarchy when the underlying auction is something else. So I'm not gonna go into the details of this. So finally, I'll talk about um, the question of auction design in the presence of auto bidding. Um, so in order to talk about auction design, I need to talk about how the bidders are behaving, how the buyers are behaving, what are they trying to achieve? So the standard model uh, for 
bidder behavior in economics is the quasi-linear utility model, where the buyers are trying to maximize their values minus their cost, right? So that's one model we'll consider. Second model we'll consider, which is inspired by the goals and constraints in the auto bidding systems, is the so-called value maximizing model, where the bidder is literally trying to maximize the objective that they set, subject to the constraints that they set. That's that's what they're trying to maximize, right? And just because a bidder is using auto bidding doesn't mean that they have the second object, they have the second utility function, but it's an it's a utility function that is plausible in this setting. Um, they could have quasi utility, they could have value maximizing utility, they could have some other utility. So if we had quasi-linear buyers who are using auto bidding just as a system because it gives them some value and they're gonna keep adjusting the inputs to the system to match their quasi-linear utility function, then most of the results from the quasi-linear utility model uh, carry over uh, to the setting with auto bidding, as long as the auto bidders are behaving optimally. But that's not the case when the bidders are actually value maximizing bidders. The utility function is value maximizing. Um, and there is an emerging area of research with lots of ongoing work where um, the goal is to develop a theory of um, auction design um, under uh, value maximizing buyers. So questions will be like, can we design auctions with better welfare and revenue? Um, what happens when we change reserve prices? How do we optimize for reserve prices? And there is this setting, the multi-channel setting, which I'll talk about in a second, which is also interesting in this case. So I'll talk about two of these things. So I'll talk about reserve prices and I'll talk about auction design, hopefully quickly. Um, so we first talk about uh, the effect of reserve prices and how it compares, how it's different between quasi-linear buyers and uh, value maximizing buyers. So let's assume that the seller is using a second price auction, a truthful auction for every item. Um, now in the case of quasi-linear buyers, it's well known that the if you change reserve prices, uh, as long as your auction is truthful, you are the, the buyer is not going to change their bid. Their, they have, their dominant strategy is to just bid their value. But that's not the case for value maximizing bidders because it's not, um, it's not in, they will basically want to shade their bids. So, and, and they, will, they will want to shade their bids differently depending on the reserve prices. So, the, so the, out, the bids change and the outcome changes as we are changing the reserve prices and it makes it um, hard to optimize for reserve prices. Um, another interesting observation is that for quasi-linear bidders, a reserve price of zero always maximizes welfare. But that's because you're basically charging zero, so you're giving every item to the person who values it the most, and no item is going unallocated. But for the case of value maximizing bidders, it's actually not the case. Sometimes you can increase welfare by raising the reserve price because you are essentially in the case of value maximizing bidders, sometimes you can afford items that are above your value because you got kind of slack on the items which were cheap for you. Um, so, so you can use that slack on very on expensive items which are actually above your value. But by raising the reserve price, we reduce the slack uh, that a buyer can get, thereby the, uh, not, not allowing them to buy items which were too expensive, which, which were much more than their value. So that can actually increase. So it's not like all the time this happens, but it can happen that increasing reserve prices can increase, increase welfare in this case. Um, so next um, I will talk about the multi-channel setting for auction design. So this setting is uh, uniquely interesting in the, uh, in the case of value maximizing bidders. Um, uh, here we have independent channels or platforms which own the different items, in this case, the different queries that we are selling or some other items, right? So think of these channels as uh, different advertising uh, platforms that the advertiser could have participated on. So they could have passed on, on Google, on Facebook, on newspapers and magazines, right? So they could have used all these advertising channels. And the advertiser is, is optimizing across all of these channels, right? So in the case of quasi-linear bidders, if I am a channel and I'm trying to optimize my own auction, 
I don't need to worry about all the other channels. What happens on the other channels does not affect their bid on my channel. But in the case of value maximizing bidders who are optimizing across channels, that's not the case anymore. What happens on the other channels, the bid landscapes on the other channels have a large impact on the bid on my channel. So, so when I change my auction, I change my reserve price, it affects the um, optimality of the auction and the reserve prices on the other channels as well. Um, so one can think of this game that the channels are playing. I set my auction, I set my reserve price, and, um, and the, then the other channel changes their auction, the reserve price, and ultimately we reach an equilibrium of which auction we are using of what reserve prices we are using. So we studied uh, two problems, like we studied two of these games. We study the game where they're setting reserve prices, and we also study the game where the channels are trying to choose between a first price auction or a second price auction and deciding which auction to go with. Interestingly, when I am the only channel, I'm there's only one channel, and the bidders are using scaled values as their bids, which is not optimal, but is the simplest strategy to use and potentially being used in practice because it's hard to do anything else. Um, if I'm the only channel in, with this kind of bidding, then it's actually optimal to use the first price auction with value maximizing bidders. But with, uh, with multiple channels, one can actually construct situations, some valuation functions, where uh, it is actually the dominant strategy for a, a channel to use the second price auction independent of what other channels are doing. So the behavior really changes whether you are a single channel, uh, in which case you might want to use the first price auction all the time. Um, or there are multiple channels competing with each other, in which case um, you might uh, use something different depending on the valuation functions. Um, sorry, I think I said all this. Um, so I'm going to skip. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so in conclusion, there are lots of new fundamental questions uh, that arise due to auto bidding. And we talked about some of those. There are many open questions uh, that are still being actively worked on. Uh, including auction design and um, and the understanding of the multi-channel setting. Thank you. Uh, Is there a quick question for Gagan before we break for lunch? Yes. Yeah, they can bidders can always collude and potentially gain as much as as if they were a single bidder. So with the, in practical setup, do you also see auto bidding and the old traditional sure. bidding coming together? And how do you like what does that so in practice, uh, yeah, these auto bidders are participating in the same auctions that were originally being run. So there are manual bidders as well as auto bidders in the same auctions. So the good thing was like, as we saw in the auto bidding algorithm, right? It just participates in the auction very naturally. Uh, and they're just, the auction is the place where they get combined together. Um, yeah. All right, well, let's break for lunch and we will convene back here at two o'clock. Thank you again. Good night.